Our first reading today comes from the book of Acts, the, first, the second chapter. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there was a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them, each one heard them speaking in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we can hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, ah, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends the reading. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the house church in Corinth. And it begins like this. No one can say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gift, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each, individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
gospel for today comes from the gospel of John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the gospel of the Lord. Holy God, give us grace and open our hearts and minds to hear your true and living word, Jesus the Christ, who will transform our lives. Amen. Receive the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, people filled with the Holy Spirit. Yep, today, today is all about the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Trinity that we are the most confused about. Oh, happy birthday, by the way. Pentecost is considered to be the birthday of the church when the Holy Spirit dramatically entered this crowd of people and each was able to hear what the Galilean speakers were saying in their own language. The Galileans were speaking Aramaic, but the hearers were from Egypt and Turkey and Arabia and Crete and Rome, Iraq, Iran, Libya. It's pretty amazing. When you hear this story, though, do you hear the reflection of the origin story from Genesis 11 about the Tower of Babel? The one where the people who all spoke one language started building a tower to reach heaven, to make a name for themselves? And then suddenly they were unable to understand each other. Well, you can bet that every person there knew this story, and the meaning was not lost on them. The meaning that God wanted everyone to reunite. As our text from Acts says today, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And here we sit, in one of the deepest periods of divisiveness in our country, it's probably second only to the Civil War. Pentecost is our yearly reminder that we are to be one for the common good. But note here that when we are one, we are one in speaking of God and God's deeds of power. We are not identical. We are all speaking in different ways according to our gifts. And there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Churches are some of the most divisive organizations around. They divide who is in and who is out. They divide over how they read the Bible. They divide over what clothes to wear. They divide over which building to worship in. How can we miss the most simple, salient idea of what church is? This is possibly our most destructive attitude. It's the equivalent of shooting ourselves in the foot. Oh no, we cry, the church is failing, people are leaving. Well, duh. Who wants to hang around where people are always arguing about what beliefs are the most right when we really ought to be focused on building relationships, not causing division? Because the church should be a model for how different people different in political views, different in age and color, sexual orientation and expression, different in economic status, different in stages of spiritual maturity, difference in the gifts that God has given us. The church should be a model for how different people can still work together to help bring about the kingdom of God here and now. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In some, it comes out as wisdom or knowledge or faith or healing or the working of miracles or prophecy or the discernment of spirits or the gift of language. We will know when it is a manifestation of the Spirit when, it, when we exhibit the gifts of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, 
generosity, goodness, self-control, all of these are activated by the same Spirit and allotted to each of us as the Spirit chooses. Jesus says to his huddled, frightened disciples, Peace be with you, twice. As the Father sent him to us, he now sends us to bring peace through forgiveness. Christians, then, are people who follow Jesus, who pattern their thought and worship and conduct after Christ and proclaim his message of peace and forgiveness to the whole world. In John 8, Jesus says, If you adhere to my teaching, you are really my disciples. In John 13, the recognizable mark of those who follow Jesus is their love for one another. So why? Why do we, especially lately, seem to toss this simple idea out of the window and start clamoring for family values or traditional values or other buzzwords that mask our real motivations? Those motivations are being to make everyone else like us, make everybody else in our image, to make everyone else identical to us, to make our congregations homogenous. Now, I've seen a few reasons why. The first one is that we have, an erected, we have erected an idol to our political parties. Yeah, both. We subordinate everything, faith, family, principle, self-interest, to our political party. We wake up in the morning and put on the glasses of our political affiliation, the ones that make us look really good and righteous and make those others look stupid or immoral or both. There's one pair of glasses that makes people look lazy, shiftless, hate law enforcement, love anarchy, and want to kill babies. There's the other type of glasses that make people look cruel, authoritarian, money-hungry at the expense of people's lives. They love mindless automatons who know their place, and they hate change. Which pair of glasses do you put on? Which idol do you worship? Which god have you placed in priority over God? The first commandment is the first for a reason. Because we are prone to erect other gods and not recognize that we've done it. It takes someone from the other side to point it out to us. I mean, I've struggled with this, and I'll bet you do too. We love to wave our political flags because it's easier than picking up a cross. We have to take off these glasses and put on the spectacles of Jesus the ones that see each person as a child of the same Heavenly Father, a fellow worker in this world, a person who is broken and in need of forgiveness and peace. Someone for whom we can be a visible sign of God's love. That involves, for us, picking up a cross, sacrificing the idols that we have made. Because love and sacrifice are two sides of the same coin. You cannot love your neighbor without sacrificing for your neighbor. Sacrificing, giving of your time, your wealth, your skills, your opinion on what is right, your ego. And that's the second reason why we toss out our calling to follow Jesus and do not pattern our thought, our worship and conduct after Christ our ego. The verses after our reading from 1 Corinthians today are particularly instructive. Verses 14 to 27 go like this. Indeed, the body of Christ does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, well, because I'm not a hand and I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, well, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. And that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, 
where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the, weakers of the, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think of as less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. And now you together are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Apparently they had the same problems in Corinth. <laughs> well, we in our egos love to think that we are, or our opinions are, more right, more indispensable. But God has arranged the body that there be no dissension within the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. God places relationship before all else in the body of Christ. Our egos like to place our ideas, our perspectives, ahead of relationship. But my beliefs are left out of the church. The church is too liberal, too woke. The church is too conservative, not accepting of me. Do you hear the ego in these statements? Do you hear the idolization of politics over God in these statements? Do you hear the negative judgment of others in these statements? There's the Eighth Commandment. We should not bear false witness. We should not deceive by lying, betraying, slandering, or ruining our neighbor's reputation, but will defend him, say good things about him, and see the best side of everything he does. I think you got that one covered? Do you always try to see the best side of the other side? Or are we constantly twisting their views for our purposes? Christianity is centered on Christ, period. If we are followers of Christ, we keep our attention on Christ and on Jesus' way of living. Of course, we can be involved in politics, run for office and vote. But we have to be very wary when we have to choose between the two. Jesus could have taken the easy way out and just given the rulers what they wanted. But his obedience to God put him at odds with both the Roman power structure and the Jewish political and social structures. It's tempting for us to get co-opted by partisan alliances political opinions, and fear. The disciples fell into it and abandoned Jesus in his time of greatest need. This is what worshiping political idols will get you. The impulses toward division and hate and anger and anxiety and fear and accumulating power over others. The early Christ followers wouldn't bow to Rome or Caesar or anything. Their legacy is often lost on us, but we must rediscover their brave willingness to follow Christ over everything. Because Jesus said, if you follow my commandments, you are my disciples. And that includes the first and the eighth commandments. So, this is Pentecost today. The birthday of the ecclesia, the church, the gathering of the people committed to following in the ways of Jesus, following in the ways of forgiveness, peacemaking and self-sacrifice, the ways of valuing relationships first and working together for the common good, the ways of the spirit 
that were given to us to help us reunite and become one body in Christ for the sake of our communities, our nations, and our world. Amen. Your kingdom's world.